Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. And we are still in our section on discrete term structure model. So big numerical interest rate models or models that are now so big that we need numerical methods to implement them. And uh, yeah, our aim is to implement here our discrete term structure model. So the guy that is for historic reason also called LIBOR market model, LIBOR London Interbank offer rate, which was uh, a popular uh, forward rate. But apart from the name, which will also pop up in the code quite often, you know, this is just a model for the simple forward rate. And from our session on collateralization, you know that we can view a market that uses, for example, a backward rate um, on, say, uh, an accrual rate that is used for the collateral account can be perfectly modeled by this model. So it's like a single curve, a single curve uh, world. So we started a section on implementation, reviewing a few of the building blocks we will put now together. So to build the model and the numerical scheme. So this is again here, our model under some measure QN. Yeah, where n is also part now of the model. This is our numeraire. So do we view the model under the spot measure or the terminal measure or some other measure? The building blocks we put together or say the blocks that we cut out of the problem and define then in terms of interfaces in our code for which we then provide implementations are the time discretization. Then of course, the Brownian increments on that time discretization. Then the Euler scheme that generates the time discrete stochastic process, the Euler scheme. And then the specification of the model in terms of, okay, so we discretize, we discretize a state space Y here that is given by some transformation, the F, the state space transform, Oh, sorry, that, that gives by some transformation, the F, the state space transform, the forward rate. So this F is part of our modeling. And then given that F or F inverse, we have our state space Y. And for that state space, we specify then the initial value, the diffusion parameters lambdas, which of course derive from the original factor loadings lambdas, yeah, once you know the function f or f inverse. Um, and of course, the model then also specifies the drift, yeah, where the drift is actually implied here by, by our choice of the numeraire. No? And of course, also by the choice of the f. So if we move to, for example, log coordinates, f is the logarithm, then the drift will get a minus one half sigma squared, yeah? actually minus one half norm lambda y squared. Yeah, these are our building blocks to create. The Brownian increments create the Monte Carlo simulation. of the Euler discretization. So we use here the Euler scheme. Given a time discretization.
of an ETO stochastic process. So that is our model of the um, SDE. So our building blocks were reviewed. We define interfaces, the random variable, because all objects here, oops, because all objects here on the previous slide are random variables. So the arithmetic operations you see here are operations on random variables. We had an interface describing what a time discretization does and corresponding implementations. We had an interface describing what a Brownian motion does, providing random variables on a certain time discretization and the corresponding implementation. And then we had the process, so our time discrete process, for which there is an implementation creating an Euler scheme, given the specification of our model parameters, model in, uh, say, a certain extended form that we also consider this transformation of the state space as part of the model. And we have a small playground where you can find experiments on these parts, uh, illustrating a little bit how they work together. In this uh, playground, um, the illustration is just done considering a Black Scholes model. So not our big model. And maybe we just have um, a short look into this again uh, and then focus on how we specify these parameters for our term structure model. So there is here the Monte Carlo process objects experiments. So experiments with objects related to that. And yeah, you know, there are already some small experiments on the time discretization, the random variables and the Brownian motion. Yeah, so let me look into the next one. I would like to make um, um, an Euler scheme discretization of the Black Scholes model and then perform a Monte Carlo simulation. So this guy is here below. So what I do is I first define my time discretization. Okay, so you see, just as we did it before, we have this convenient constructor. I define a Brownian motion. The Black Scholes model just has a single DW, so it's not the case uh, where we have multiple factors as we will have soon. So it's just one factor here, 10,000 passed, some random number seed. Now we have this convenient constructor here providing us a pawn in motion. And then let me do the Black Schultz model, which is ds equals r s d t plus sigma s d w. Here I call the s just x. Um, let me do that with an initial value of 100, uh, a risk-free rate, the R of 5% and volatility of 10%. And I like to do it just plainly. Yeah, so everything in a single spot with my random variables and these guys here. So I initialize the vector of X. Yeah, so here, X will be an, an array of random variables. So X at time T I is X of I, X of I. So I just allocate some memory for this vector of random variables. I initialize the time zero value to just the random variable. So I have here a floating point number. I have to wrap it into something that implements a random variable. That's my scalar. And then I loop over all time steps. Yeah, so this is a loop over all time step. So uh, the i is zero. So the next point is i plus one. Yeah, I'm stepping. I get the time step size from my time discretization. I get the Brownian increment from my Brownian motion. And then I say, 
the next value is the previous value. Okay, so let's use log Euler scheme. So you see here, log Euler scheme. So log Euler scheme means I move to the logarithm. I then perform Euler discretization. Logarithm of x at ti plus one is equal to logarithm of x at ti. Last mu from Eto's lemma, because I moved to logarithm, I have a minus one half sigma squared plus sigma dw. And then if I apply exponential again, I have x of i plus one equals x of i multiplied with exponential from of r minus one half sigma squared delta ti plus sigma delta w of ti. Okay, so I have a log Euler scheme. I would like to do a log Euler scheme. So that this means next value as previous value multiplied with the Brownian increment multiplied with sigma and then add the drift. The drift is R minus one half sigma squared delta T. And from that here all, I take the exponential. Yes, you know now all these things here are functions on random variable. Yeah? So for example, this here is the function that takes the random variable and creates the exponential of that random variable and returns the new value. So this is already a very short line because the loop over all sample paths is um, hidden in this. And also the generation of the sample paths is just hidden in this line here. Yeah? So, so it's fairly short, but we just use the plain objects. And then I plot this process. So I have some convenient helper here. The first thing is I create a function that maps time to a random variable. So a double to random variable function. So if you look into this here, this is just a function that takes as argument a value and a floating point value double, that is a time and returns a random variable. So time maps to X and then get from my time discretization, the corresponding time index. Uh, so since I pass here to this plotting function, the same time discretization is guaranteed that I only get times for which there is an index. But on the case where um, this is not guaranteed, you could here use some other method like get time index nearest less or equal. Yeah? So then he would create a piecewise constant uh, function out of this. Mm -hmm piecewise constant in the sense that for interpolating times, you get the same random variable, but that's not needed here. Okay, I can plot this and we see uh, the simulation path of um, a Black-Scholes model. Yeah, as you see a little bit, the exponential growth here yeah, and uh, the log normal distribution. Okay, I have a class that creates the Euler scheme. So I can encapsulate here this step into um, a class that does this. Once I provide the model specification. So let's do that with the Euler scheme implementation. And the first thing is maybe a bit shocking because the, this is far more lengthy but uh, in the end, it will become much cleaner because here, uh, a lot of stuff is clued together. Yeah. So for example, uh, the numerical method of creating the discrete process and the model parameters or the model is a little bit clued, clued together. Yeah. For example, that we have here a log coordinate and this is a minus one half sigma squared. So my next experiment is that I like to illustrate this now using the Euler scheme class. So that's the guy below. Uh, we have the same steps, time discretization, Brown in motion. But now I use here this 
Euler Scheme vom Process Model. So the guy here, yeah. So going through the script, we had the random variable, the time discretization, the problem in motion. And now we are here. The process implemented by this Euler scheme from process model. So the specification of the parameters that should be used for this Euler scheme are here my process model. So I need some process model as an input, the process model. This is just the specification of these parameters and a little bit more and my Brownian motion. So my Euler scheme has as input the two parts, the blue parts, the specification of my model and the red part, the Brownian driver, the stochastic increment. Yeah, I need to specify here this process model. And what is this? If you look process model, this is an interface. It's an interface that specifies the function f, this transform, the initial state. So that's the initial value of the process y, so the transform process. The drift, but it's also the drift of the process y. The transform process and the factor loadings, though the coefficients lambda of this process y. So he's discretizing the process y and then he applies this transformation to get the variable which we like to discretize. In addition, since we specify the drift, we have to know the measure under which we simulate. So we also specify here the numerator. The numeraire may be as a function of the process that we simulate. Now there's a nice thing here. Um, I should implement now a class implementing this interface. But what you can do um, is if you just write process model, this is an, an interface and you cannot create um, an object via new from an interface because he does not know the implementation. But um, if you do this, you can just provide the implementation in line. Yeah? So you see now um, he will create in line a so-called anonymous yeah, class, in a class, anonymous class. So um, I can just implement this class here instead of creating a separate file. And if I say add, unimplemented method, Eclipse will help me and tell me what is the stuff I have to do. And you see, the stuff I have to do is much more lengthy than what we had in the simple implementation before. Because now I have to implement all these functions here. What is the initial state? Yeah. What is the drift? What is the factor loadings? What are the factor loadings? And since I have to pass here an index, I also have to know how many factors do we have and so on. So here is the solution for my Black-Scholz model. The Black-Scholz model just has one component. Yeah? Apart from the numerator, there's only the stock. I would like to go do log Euler scheme. So my state space transform is the exponential. The initial value is then the logarithm of the initial value, the initial state, the initial value of the uh, y. My drift is because I have moved to log coordinates, r minus one half sigma squared. My factor loading is just the sigma, not the sigma s, because we moved to the logarithm by this state space transform being the exponential. I just have one factor, yeah, so the length of this vector here is just um, one. And um, yeah, okay, there are some other methods, yeah. This is the time that is associated with t equals zero. That's not so 
important. Yeah, so you have to write down the specification and then you can pass the specification here to this guy and uh, plot this too. So let's run this guy. Okay, and now this is here using Euler scheme from process model. We have the same, the same plot as before, our Euler scheme. Of course, you do not like to write down always these specifications. So what we have is that we have special classes implementing this specification. So there is a Black Scholes model here that is just using our parameters initial value, the X initial value, R and Sigma, and which has inside exactly this specification. Yeah, So you see that's exactly this specification. We move to the log coordinates, the transform is the exponential, and the initial value drift and factor loadings for the process Y are just log of initial value of X, R minus one half sigma squared and the sigma. Yeah, so I could also run now this test Euler scheme with Black Schultz model, where we use this class to provide the model. So let's run that guy. Okay, so this is now using Euler scheme from process model with the Black Schultz model. So I have here many different uh, specifications of such models. So if you look at the type hierarchy of this process model, okay, so you see there's here some abstract process model, which is doing some basic stuff. And then you see yeah, a collection of some models. Yeah, there are some equity model, Black Schulz, Bachelier, yeah, um, a Heston model or a Merton model, but there are also interest rate models. There is the Hal White model or our labor market model. So I'd like to discuss now this guy with you, which is providing the specification for our discrete term structure model. So going back to our script, that was the Euler scheme. So the Euler scheme, our process, yeah, takes the process model as an input, but the interface just provides then a single value. So it just provides here our stochastic process, the time discrete ties stochastic process xi at a certain time tj. So this is the time index j. This is the component of my vector xi. So this xi could be, for example, x0 is the stock in a Black Scholz model, or xi is the forward rate in an interest rate model. So this process get, generates different such time discrete SDEs depending on which model we put in. Of course, since there is the time discretization here, we also know the time discretization. We can give you the time discretization, but my Euler scheme knows the time discretization because the Brownian motion is an input to it. And the Brownian motion has an associated time discretization. So if we do Monte Carlo, I also have an additional interface that tells you, okay, there are additional methods that you could ask for in the Monte Carlo setup. For example, there is this guy here, which would give you back the Brownian motion used to create this time discrete process. <clears throat> so actually my Euler scheme here is implementing this a little bit richer interface, the Monte Carlo process. So you can also ask for the Brownian motion that was used. Okay, and here you see my 
implementation of this Euler scheme, which has the two inputs, the specification of the model parameters in terms of this process model and the Brownian increments, the stochastic driver that generates the delta Ws. So now we also saw our process models, many examples. So we looked, for example, here into our Black Scholes model. And what I would like to discuss with you is the LIBOR market model from covariance model, just another implementation of our process model, which gives us here the specification of the model parameters. So the process model gives me the specification of the model parameters. This is the interface we have to implement, the interface process model. So we have to implement the initial state. This is our y of zero. We have to implement the drift. This is our mu, but it's the mu of the process y. We have to implement the factor loadings. So this is our lambda, yeah, but the lambda of y. And we have to specify this transformation that transforms the y to the x. So this is the so this is the function f that transforms y to x. So now there is um, a small issue in my setup with the interest rate model that was actually not apparent so much in the Black Scholes model or in the equity world. And what is this issue? Okay, so if you look here on this slide, you see that there is a very nice dependency that a higher level or the next step object depends on the previous step object. So for example, the Brownian motion depends on the time discretization. The Euler scheme depends on the Brownian motion and the model. So it is step by step we build the next object of interest. However, if I have generated now my time discrete stochastic process, and from that I get my forward rates by this transformation, then the numerator depends on these forward rates. So somehow there is a kind of back loop that I need the simulated forward rates and I have to plug them into the model again to know the simulated numerator. Yeah. So if the tilde here on top, so sometimes I'm strict, I put the tilde on top to indicate that this is the time discrete approximation of the original stochastic process. So if the tilde on top denotes the approximation, the time discrete approximation, then this here gives me the n tilde at ti. And actually, you know, for our forward rate model, we would get the n tilde at capital Ti only at the tenor time discretization because there are small gaps in our model, but maybe I just write it like that. If I now plug in the L tilde to this function here, and this is part of the model. So I like to have immutable objects 
So immutable objects means that I do not like to modify the object after they have been constructed. But here in this implementation of the numeraire, there is so a small challenge. The numeraire should be provided by the model. So it should be in my blue component, so to say. Since the model also specifies the drift. This is my thing with the cohesion. Yeah? Numeraire and drift should be specified in the same part because they have a dependency. The simulated process depends on the model. And of course, my numeraire depends on the simulated process. So mu, lambda, and so on, they give me the L tilde, and the L tilde gives me the numeraire. So it appears a little bit tempting to also have, say, a reference to the process in the model. Yeah? So the so model knows the process, my model here knows the simulated process, yeah, or say here this L tilde, but also the process knows the model. So it appears to be tempting to add a reference to that process in the model. And by that, you have two objects that reference each other. So it's not this straight line, yeah, so that higher level references the previous level, you know, like the Brownian motion references the time discretization and the Euler scheme references the Brownian motion. So there is some back and forth. And that's a bit ugly because I cannot construct the process before I have constructed the model. So if I think in terms of construction and for the process, I need the model, but also now for the model, actually I should need the process so I can calculate the numeraire. This is a problem if you think of immutable objects because I have the requirement that I do not like to change my objects once I have constructed it. And also if you would like to reuse the model for different Euler schemes, for example, you have the same Black-Scholes model, but you use different time discretizations, different Brownian motions. Then you would like to use the same model in different discretizations. That would not be possible because now there is a reference in the model to the specific discretization to calculate the numeraire. I like to avoid this, and the way to avoid this is also obvious. It's already here on the slide, the process is an argument of the function that defines the numeraire. Yeah? So this is an argument. This subtle thing is not visible if you think of black shows because there the numeraire is just an e to the minus R, uh, e to the RT. So in Black Scholes, the numeraire is just e to the rt. So given the r, which is a model parameter, you know the numeraire independent of the discretization scheme because you know the numeraire analytically. But here, uh, our numeraire is a complicated function of the values that we discretize. Yeah? It's a stochastic numeraire. So interesting aspect, and... Uh, this is how we resolve it. So this here is our model. Yeah? So this is the implementation of the process model. You see it, it extends here abstract process model. So this is my LIBOR market model from covariance model. So the guy that I like to discuss now with you. This guy, it ex extends here abstract process model. But if you look into that, it's just the interface process model and uh, one additional convenient uh, method yeah, that makes uh, 
a vector out of the initial values. Okay, so that's the guy we would like to look at now. And you find this in our library in interest rate models now. This guy is here. And it has a method that calculates the numeraire there. Okay. And you see the simulated process, so our Euler scheme, is an argument to this method. So this is my function n here, the function n that has to be provided by my model. So this is the implementation of my function n, oops, n of t, so n of the simulation time on my time discretization, and yeah, my forward rates. Actually on the script I had that sometimes I need also forward rates four times before the time t. So there is here the argument time and the argument that we need the simulated process. There is some additional stuff going on here in this implementation. Uh, one stuff is this adjustment here for the discount curve. We will look at this later. So let's dig a little bit deeper and see that this is really, really done here. Yeah. So digging a little bit deeper, let's look into this guy. So there is some stuff going on related to interpolation. So check if the numeraire time is on our discretization grid, on our tenor time discretization grid. So this could be tenor time. Uh, so if this is uh, not the case, there's some stuff going on. If it is the case, there is some other method where we are on the grid. And this is now the guy where something is going on. For example, you see here our numeraire for the terminal measure. So this here is the numeraire for the terminal measure. So numeraire is the bond that matures at the end of the tenor time discretization. And this here is the spot measure, where the numeraire is always reinvest into the next zero copper bond and accrue some interest. So you see this guy here is just the product of one plus LJ delta TJ yeah, to the power of minus one. Okay, so this product is here. We have here the new numeraire is the previous numeraire. And then discount with this rate. So discount here is the divide by one plus L J delta J. Let's look that up. So you see there's here the function discount. It's an operation on the random variable. Now all operations are again on random variables. We get spared by always having the loop over all sample paths. And this is the one plus L delta tj, yeah, the delta tj, the period length is on my time discretization, the period length. So this rate here, this forward rate is created by this function, okay, for historic reason get LIBOR. And if you see this function is just taking the process and asking back the process, what is the simulated value? So we simulate all values L and then here we have the process as an argument to the function that calculates the numeraire. 
So that's how I solved this yeah, interdependency. So what my model is providing is the function that creates out of the simulated process, the simulated numeraire. By this, we are very flexible. So speaking of being flexible, now comes the next point. Our model is actually not just a model like the Black Scholes model. It is a model framework in the following sense. If you go back here, yeah, so now I have discussed the numeraire. Maybe you also have some intuition when to use a transformation, yeah, when it is maybe nice due to the numer uh, numerical accuracy. So the numeraire determines the calculation of the drift. We have already discussed the calculation of the drift. Yeah, so that's specification of the measure and maybe the specification of the state space variable. But the big ingredients in the model is the specification of our parameter lambda. Here in our model specification, our factor loadings, the coefficients in front of the independent Brownian increments, because these factor loadings lambda determine the covariance structure. So if this lambda is a matrix, then lambda transposed lambda is the covariance, the instantaneous covariance matrix. And you can split this covariance matrix then in a volatility parameter sigma i and a correlation matrix rho ij to have actually this representation where we specified the model using a volatility parameter in front of a single Brownian increment dw delta w um, where these guys have an instantaneous correlation. So I can create now many different models because recall there were different popular versions that just were distinguished by how we specify here this diffusion coefficient. And you can do a lot of stuff with this. If you know the Heath-Jerome-Morton framework, you know that this model is just a discretization of the Heath-Jerome-Morton framework. And you can create, for example, all short rate models by just specifying this uh, factor loadings lambda. So the whole white model is not another model. It's just a specification of this coefficient here apart from the fact that we have a discretized interest rate curve, a discrete forward rate term structure, apart from that uh, fact. So this is the most interesting thing. And for that reason, I do not want to write a new process model for all these guys. I want to have some kind of a plug-in. So I delegate the call to the get factor loadings to another interface. Yeah? So again, recall interfaces allow us to plug in different implementations to exchange the implementations of a specific part. Yeah, let's have a look at this. So it's left open to specify our factor loadings. The factor loadings may have different form and we define an interface that provides these parameters. It's these parameters. Part of the model, so let's draw it also in blue, but now I'll use maybe a bit darker blue because it is another component. My interface is the term structure covariance model. This is just when I do not have time discretization for the term structure or the LIBOR covariance model if I use um, a fixed tenor discretization, yeah, then I use the word LIBOR covariance model. Yeah. 
historic reason. It provides the parameter lambda. And we have many different implementations for this. And we will also do some, some nice experiments with this. So these guys function as plugins to our process model. So these two guys here, they provide the lambda, how we create the lambda, and they provide it to our process model. So let's look into this in the code. This is our big class specifying now our Liber market model, our discrete term structure model as a process model. So you see, if I go in here again, this is the implementation of the process model. This is just the implementation of this interface with the F, the initial value, the numeraire, the drift, and we have to specify the get factor loadings. So this is the lambda. So let's look at the lambda specification in my library market model. So somewhere here, so we have all these specifications. There should be the get factor loading. Yeah, let's have a look. So what you see is this is the function that specifies the lambda. Since my lambda could depend on L, I do the same trick that my lambda is a function of the process, so I can ask for the L. This is my lambda at a certain time index. Lambda depends on time. So this here is the lambda i k of t j, where this here is j, this here is i, and I get back the vector of all k's, yeah, because this is convenient because I have to, to do the sum over all k, lambda i k, delta w k. So here on the slide, this get factor loadings is providing here the vector for every i and every tj. I get the vector as a vector in k yeah, because I have to do this scalar product then with the Brownian increments. And you see my function is just calling the same function on another object. So this is called delegation. So we have a delegation pattern here. I'm delegating the task to calculate this lambda to some other object. And let's have a look, what is this object here? So this object is here on top of my model, where all the specification of my model is. For example, the initial value is just the forward rate curve. And there is here this covariance model. And you see the specification says, this should be an interface. An interface that just tells me I have a function to calculate this coefficient lambda. Okay, so this here is the coefficient lambda for little t and capital T, like in his Gerald Morton framework. And here it would be for um, a little t and the index i uh, of the capital T i. And here it is for a time discretization. So the index j, little t j, capital T I, I get the vector of these factor loadings. For convenience, I'm providing here the L uh, as a vector. So I'm not providing the process. I provide here just the L um, as, a, as a vector. So there is also some convenient method. If you know the factor loadings, you know the norm um, squared is... Uh, the variance and the lambda i scalar product with lambda j is the covariance. So for convenience, you can then also calculate the covariance. This guy also has a time discretization. 
So it needs to know the time discretization and it has an associated tenor discretization. So he also knows the tenor discretization. So it's a model of its own. We could model piecewise constant coefficient lambda, yeah, uh, or piecewise depending on simulation time or depending on tenor time piecewise constant. Yeah, so we, we are flexible. So this is a model within a model. So I have um, a, a model framework. So there are some uh, popular forms like an exponential, exponential decaying volatility and exponential decaying correlation, then fused together to a covariance structure. So you may just look at some implementations of this covariance model. So if I open here the type hierarchy, you see there are some implementations. Our displaced log normal model, for example. Um, also a stochastic volatility model where the covariance is becoming stochastic using um, an Heston model. It may be also of interest, there is here this nice little thing that builds the covariance out of a specification of a volatility and correlation. So you see this guy has two inputs, a volatility model, so which is an abstract class, yeah, could be an interface, but there are some, some other things implemented. And the abstract thing that has to be implemented is provide me the sigma I at time tj. So this is the specification of the sigma. And there's a correlation model. So provide me the rho ij. So this is actually provide me the fik. Yeah, you know, we do the Cholesky decomposition and provide the fik. Once we have the sigma and the fik, the volatility and the correlation in terms of the Cholesky decomposition, then I can calculate the lambda that was here. The lambda is sigma times fik. So this is the covariance model. This is my volatility model. And this is my correlation model. Yeah, because the FIKs, they are the Cholesky decomposition of the correlation matrix. If I have the sigma and the FIKs, yeah, I have just that the lambda is take the sigma and multiply with correlation model, get factor loading, multiply with the FIK. So we have this convenient little guy that allows us to split the modeling again into two parts. We can independently specify the volatility model and the correlation model. So now we are almost done. We have now many plugins and can build many different models and experiments with them. There is a little thing that is uh, yeah, still open. Um, when we create our time discrete stochastic process, so we take our PLU model specification, which is now very flexible, and from that we use our Euler scheme to create the Euler scheme discretization xi, say tilde, of tj. So here, in our case, these are the li's of tj in tilde. Yeah, my Euler scheme just provides these guys in terms of the function get process value. And it's not clear what is this x that we provide. It has different interpretations depending on which model was used for the Euler scheme. For example, we could use a Black-Schultz model for a stock. 
plug it in into our Euler scheme and our Euler scheme will provide us with the time discretization of S. We could use our discrete forward rate model, plug it in into our Euler scheme and the X from the Euler scheme is now the forward rate Li. So also you see there is very different nature. Here we simulate an asset and here we simulate an interest rate. The zero Cooper bond is a complicated function of this L and has to be calculated. Yeah? So here we just get an asset and here we get some derived quantity from which we would have to calculate zero Cooper bond prices. And also these indices here are associated with the time discretization. So when I like to value product, yeah. so now my motivation is that I like to evaluate products. Then in the product valuation code, I, I would like to write something like get asset I or get forward rate from TI to TI plus one. I would like to have a meaningful function that I pass to this time discrete stochastic process that immediately tells me what is the object that I'm requesting there. If I just request get process value and the information, what is this index here? So what is the fifth element of this vector? What, what is the kind uh, of this object? If I just have this in my product valuation code, that's maybe a bad design. So I like to have a wrapper around this that creates a model like get forward rate and maps it given the time discretization of my interest rate curve to the correct element of this ve vector. So for the product valuation, we like to have a consistent interface that provides the relevant quantities to our valuation code. So for example, in the discrete forward rate term structure model, I would like to have a method where I can just ask, give me the forward rate for the period from TI to TI plus one. And he immediately knows this is the ith element in the vector of this this time discrete process. So I'm creating some kind of wrapper. So an interface of this wrapper is my term structure Monte Carlo simulation model or the LIBOR model, Monte Carlo simulation model. And what I would like to have are methods like get forward rate and get numeraire. So the get process model is transformed. So the get process value is transformed to this method, yeah, which is then meaningful for our financial product. So how do we do this? Yeah, we just define an interface yeah, and the associated design patterns are here maybe the adapter pattern. So we have a class that converts somehow um, the method of one class to another class. Yeah? So we have an interface as an input yeah? and we just create some other methods delegating calls to the input interface, maybe just with a different name or the facade pattern yeah so it's just the facade that that we are creating and it's it's more or less just the renaming of our get process value to uh, get forward rate yeah, it's ki kind of kind of re renaming so this is how my interface looks like the interface that I would like to have. Maybe I could also allow for interpolations already on the forward rates and the numerators. So then these are not here time indices. It could be really times. Yeah? 
So that would be a nice interface for the product valuation. I can ask the product, give me the forward rate, give me the number here, and I can value all kind of interest rate uh, products. But here we have, again, a subtle point. And this is the same point as we had for the numerea. Who knows which element in the vector that we are simulating, so by element in the vector we are simulating, I'm referring here to the index i. Who knows the interpretation, the meaning of this object? Yeah, we are transforming this with this state space transform back to the li, but li, what is li? It is the forward rate for a certain period. So there is a time discretization here associated to these guys. Our tenor discretization, the discretization for the interest rate curve. And the mapping from index to this time discretization is actually here in the specification of my SDE. Yeah, so this I here, is associated with that I use the coefficient lambda ik that belongs to the i's forward rate. And also that my drift has the interpretation, it is the drift related to the i's forward rate. So you see that all this information, which encodes what is the interpretation of the i's component of my time discrete stochastic process is contained in the model. So the model should know how to perform this correct retransformation. So again, I have the situation that this transformation to the correct interpretation should be in the model. So I delegate this transformation to my model. So here you see an implementation of the previous interface. So I just implement the two parts, get forward rate, get numerea. We already know that the numerea is something that is provided by my model. So I just get delegate to the model. Please give me the numerea for a given process. But now I also like to have the model telling me how is this time discrete process transformed back to a forward rate. What you have as inputs here are now the two objects, model and process, and we are creating this forward rate. That's on it is still a hierarchy that is very linear, time discretization, brown in motion. Then on the other side, I have model. The two enter into the Euler scheme. The model knows that it has functions that create out of the Euler scheme, the numerea and the forward rate. So now I have just another class that calls back these functions with the process. yeah. So everything is still a nice linear hierarchy. And that's the end point in my hierarchy. And now we are done. We have a nice interface that gives us our two quantities of interest, the forward rates and the numerator with which we can work then. So this design pattern, yeah, another pattern that pops up here is called delegation. And we had this delegation uh, at different times points, yeah, we delegated how to calculate lambda uh, to a model within a model, our covariance model, uh, and here we delegate back the way how to calculate the forward rate uh, to, this, uh, the, to this process model. So this guy that is taking the two and implementing our nice interface here, yeah, the interface that has some convenient methods for getting the time discretization 
uh, and getting the forward rate either here under the name for get LIBOR in this historic set for historic reasons or here just labeled get forward rate. So this is my interface, get forward rate. And then I plug in the model and the process and we just delegate either to the process when we need something like the time discretization or we delegate to the model yeah, when we need, for example, the numerea or the forward rate. So we have a few minutes left. This is uh, our setup, yeah, my nice little hierarchy. Time discretization enters into the Brownian motion. The Brownian motion and the model define the process. And then I can create this wrapper, yeah. Okay, since the process also knows the model, it's enough to just reference the process, but actually this guy knows both through this and generates this wrapper. Summary, my components are nicely separated. So what we separated are numerical methods, yeah? how do random variables perform calculations? How does the Brownian motion generate the randomness from the model? So the model does not know how the Brownian motion generates its random variable. We also separated the Euler scheme time discretization from our model specification. The process does not know what is being discretized. This knowledge is in the model. We may use now different numerical methods, for example, for bound motion, the process discretization, the random variables, and we may use this with many different models. But actually, my model is also a framework where I can plug in now different specifications for the lambda. Abstraction of product valuation code from the model was the next step we did. I have an interface that just provides the forward rate and the numerator. And now we could forget about what model was used. We could even forget about, is it a short rate model? Is it a discrete term structure model? Yeah. We just provide forward rates and numerator and can value different uh, products. So this is here my interface term structure, Monte Carlo simulation, the one which we have here. So I can just write any valuation code now in terms of these two functions, give me the forward rate and give me the numerator. So I can create now a collection of financial products, the caplet, the swap, the swap chain, Bermudan option, complicated product that only rely on these two methods. So that's the next level of abstraction we have from our framework. Product valuation. So product valuation, I will discuss it um, <clears throat> a bit later when we investigate uh, properties of the products. So my last slide here on these components. I now have L and N for the product valuation. So the get forward rate and get numeria method. Yeah, product valuation, uh, we just discuss it uh, a bit later. Yeah, I have now many different products that can be valued once I pass in a model that implements this interface. I would like to do numerical experiments with you. 
And so that's maybe here a nice point to stop. I will use now my framework to conduct some nice numerical experiments that we gain a deeper understanding. And maybe I use one more minute just to give you a teaser what we will do, because you will also see how these building blocks are now put together. So the first thing is that we will build a simple model for our numerical test. Actually, it's not so simple. So I would like to have some parameters where I can turn a little bit and see what is happening. For example, I will change the volatility, the correlation, yeah, the number of factors, all this stuff. I will change the measure from spot to terminal and so on. And we can investigate this. So I have some kind of model factory and my model factory has some parameters which we can change. So for example, there is the period length that tells me the discretization of my forward rate curve. There is um, a forward rate curve. For our experiment, it's enough to start with a constant flat forward rate curve. So I just have this constant. There is a time discretization for my numerical scheme. So for the first experiments, it's enough to have a coarse time discretization. I just choose the period length again. But then I like to be a little bit flexible. And my model within the model, so my model for lambda is given in terms of volatility and correlation. And the volatility should be an exponential decaying function, which has a decay parameter. So it's A times e to the minus c, and then it's time to maturity, so ti minus t. So the volatility becomes larger if I approach capital ti. And in the end, when we have capital ti, the volatility has reached this parameter a. For the correlation, I would like to have an exponential decaying function. So my correlation is now an exponentially decaying function with an exponential decay parameter. My correlation matrix has rank M. Yeah, so I use a specific number of factors. And I would like to have this interpolation between log normal and normal, which we had in the very beginning where I discussed different versions of the model. So there should be some kind of blending parameter, alpha, so that should be here an alpha, it's a small typo here. That allows me to interpolate between log normal and normal. So you see our function here for our lambda i is a quite complicated function with different parameters and we can investigate these. Other parameters are the choice of the measure and we could also change what kind of random variable implementation we use. I have such a construction here and next session we will play with the parameters, gain some nice insights. For example, an insight is that what we already had, that the interest rate curve becomes steeper in the under the equivalent martingale measure and we can investigate this. And let me just finish by showing you here this code that creates the model because there you have all the building blocks now together. Yeah, It's just two slides, this one and this one, but maybe it's nice to go through this here in the code. Yeah, So this is in our experiments, the term structure Monte Carlo simulation experiments where we will create many or conduct many experiments. So that's lying around here. Um, so there are many experiments here, which we will look at later. And all experiments use this model factory here to create our model. So this model factory is here. And this model factory now has all these parameters that I mentioned, the constant forward rate, the period length, 
time horizon, the volatility, the exponential decay of the volatility, this blending interpolation parameter, and so on. And what we do. So first thing is create the time discretization corresponding to my interest rate curve discretization, the capital TJ. Create the initial value of the model. So we can use our curves. So I use the forward curve interpolation. Well, the interpolation is trivial. This is just some time points here, but at all the time points, I have the same value. So it's constant. So it's just a constant inter interpolation of this curve. But you could use our whole interest rate curve framework to create the initial value of this model. The initial value is a curve. We could have a separate discount curve and from that, a model with the forward and the discount curve. This is the initial value and the interest rate curve discretization. Then create the time discretization little ti for our simulation. Well, actually, that was called tj, and the tenor was often called ti, right? So that way, let's see. Um, yeah, it's just, again, our time discretization with the convenient constructor creating an evenly spaced time discretization. Create a volatility model with an exponential decay. Yeah, for that, I have an implementation that implements an exponentially decaying sigma function. Create a correlation model with an exponential decay. For that, I have an implementation that co creates a correlation matrix with an exponentially decaying function ensuring that the correlation matrix has rank M. Combine the two volatility and correlation to the covariance. That was the implementation we saw. At the local volatility factor, alpha Li of zero plus one minus alpha Li of T. So this is actually the displacement, you know, displaced model. So this here is a constant. This is just the plus Di. Okay, so this is like an Li plus Di. Okay. So this is the interpolation that interpolates between log normal model and normal model. Create that with a corresponding parameter. And then I have my covariance model. And then I plug all these things together. Yeah, The forward curve as the initial value, the covariance model as the lambda, my tenor discretization, the T, capital Ti, and some properties. And these properties are now the measure, if I'm on the spot measure, and maybe also some specifications for interpolations. Then we have our process model. So this guy here is our process model. We create the Brown in motion, and we plug in the model and the Brown in motion. And then we wrap everything up here in this guy. And this guy is the guy that just gives me the forward rate and the numeria. So for example, if I now return this term structure model here in my experiment, in my experiment, I have created the term structure model and I can ask it here for a forward rate to, for example, plot now different uh, forward rate curves yeah, under different parameter settings. That was it for today. We will continue with these experiments in the next session.